So Ankar gave an overview of what we're planning to talk about at the conference in terms of individualism versus collectivism, and he, and he showed all the various roots in metaphysics, epistemology, and ethics that give rise to that conflict. Um, for the next two talks, myself and Ben Bayer, we're going we're gonna to drill into the issue of ethics, and we're going to talk about the conflict between egoism and altruism. So I'm going to talk about the virtue of selfishness. And I'm borrowing this from the title of a book by Ayn Rand. She has a collection of essays on, on ethics or morality, and she called it the virtue of selfishness. Now, right away, this is a very provocative perspective, right? Why would she call selfishness a virtue? Why would she say selfishness is a good thing? Right? Everybody in the world uh, takes it for granted that selfishness is a bad thing, that, it, that it's a vice, not a virtue. Well, the reason she calls selfishness a virtue is she thinks that we're deeply mistaken about the way we think about morality. Um, so Rand's perspective is that our conventional way of thinking about morality, of right and wrong, of good and evil, is completely wrong. It's 100% mistaken. So she's challenging our conventional wisdom about morality. If you look at history, you know, there have often been thinkers who take things that we think are completely obvious and they show us that we were completely wrong. They completely overturn it. We see this in the history of science. If you look up in the sky, you can literally see the sun moving from east to west every day. So it seems perceptually obvious that the sun is moving and the earth is stationary, right? So the idea that it's actually the earth that's moving and that it's orbiting the sun at 70,000 miles per hour, I mean, this is completely crazy, right? And yet, uh, Copernicus and Galileo and Kepler and Newton showed us that we were completely wrong about our perspective about the motion of the Earth and the Sun. It's the Earth that moves, um, not the Sun. So Ayn Rand is, is, is uh, uh, a revolutionary thinker on this kind of scale. She's challenging our conventional wisdom about morality in the same way that people have challenged our conventional wisdom about scientific issues. So she's challenging us to rethink 2,000 years of moral tradition. Now, if you ask people why is selfishness bad, you know, I think most people would say that what selfishness means is concern for yourself without regard for others or at the expense of other people. And this is what you see in the dictionary. You know, if you, if you look up the definition of selfishness, you see, you know, concern for one's own welfare or advantage at the expense of or in disregard of other people, or caring only for oneself regardless of others. This is what you see. Now, I got some help in Portuguese uh, looking up egoismo, and I think it's essentially the same idea. Is that, is that it's essentially the same concept? Is that right? Okay, so it's, so it's pursuing your own benefit without regard for others or at the expense of others. So we think of, you know, the guy at the party who takes four slices of pizza before anybody else has even had one, right? Or we think of the guy on the road who's always cutting people off so he can get where he's going a little bit, of, bit faster, and I realized coming to Brazil, this should have been a picture of a guy on a motorcycle, but, you know. Or worse, you know, we think of um, a criminal like Al Capone. Is everyone familiar with Al Capone? So he was, a, he was a mafia boss in Chicago in the 1920s. You know, he's the leader of a violent gang who steals and murders and commits bribery and extortion. So he's someone who's trying to enrich himself by exploiting and preying on other people. Now, if that's what selfishness means, if these are the types of people that the concept refers to, then no wonder we all think it's bad. I mean, these are 
pretty nasty individuals. Now, Pizza Guy is not exactly Al Capone, um, <clears throat> so they're not all on the same level, but it's the same idea. It's the idea of pursuing their own advantage in disregard of others or at the expense of others. So if that's what selfishness means, it makes sense that we view it as something bad. But the question is, is this really what selfishness means? Is our conventional understanding of selfishness correct? You know, does it make sense that these are the kinds of people we should think of when we think about what it means to be selfish? So notice that there's something a little odd about our, our definition, the way we usually think about it. Our conventional definition has these two parts to it, or two different components. Part of our understanding of selfishness is the idea of you know, that it, that it involves concern for your own interests, right? It involves the pursuit of your own benefit or your own well-being. But the other part is the idea that this necessarily involves a disregard for others or that it necessarily comes at the expense of others. Now, the question is why do we include both of these parts? Why do we think that selfishness involves both a concern for one's own interests and a disregard for or an exploitation of others. There's a certain implication here that these have to go together, that you can only pursue your self-interest if you have no regard for other people or if you prey on them or exploit and victimize other people. In other words, there's an assumption that's built in to our conventional understanding of selfishness, that one person can only get ahead if another person loses out that the only kinds of relationships that are possible between people are win-lose relationships. Now the question is, does that seem right to you? In, in, when you interact with people, does it seem right that the only kinds of interactions you ever have with people are win-lose interactions, where one person gets ahead and the other person loses out? I mean, I think that seems pretty obviously wrong because we all experience win-win relationships all the time. You know, when you go to work, you benefit by getting paid. Your employer benefits from the work that you do. Your work adds value to the company. So that's a win-win relationship. Nobody's preying on anybody. Or if you spend time with your friends, you know, hopefully you enjoy each other's company, right? This is why you're friends. Um, you benefit by spending time together. It adds value to your life and to theirs. So where's the indifference to others? Or where's the exploitation of others in this relationship? Even when you do something as simple as buying groceries, you benefit by getting the food that you need and the grocery store benefits by getting paid. So this is a win-win exchange. Again, where's the disregard for others or the victimization? Now you can multiply these examples a thousand times. It's just not true that you can only pursue your own self-interest by disregarding or exploiting other people. So there's something deeply wrong. Um, yeah. There's something deeply wrong with taking these two different ideas and packaging them together under a single concept as though they have to go together. There's, there's something mistaken about packaging together this idea of being concerned for your own interest with this phenomenon of, of disregarding or victimizing others. Now, Ayn Rand had a term for this kind of thinking mistake. She called it a package deal. And I, I, uh, I talked to a Portuguese translator. So there, there isn't really, I don't think there's an equivalent word in Portuguese, but you know when you, when you book an all-inclusive vacation and you get your flight and your hotel and the food and the drinks, that's a, in English, that's called a package deal. Like you get a good deal and it's a package. Uh, now it's a good kind of package deal. Hopefully you're getting a good deal on your vacation. Um, but what Ayn Rand is concerned about are bad kinds of package deals. And, and in particular, what she's on the lookout for are conceptual package deals. So these are concepts that package together things that don't belong together. And in her view, our conventional understanding of selfishness is a package deal. It, it, it doesn't mean what people typically think it means. It wrongly packages together these things that don't belong together. Okay, so it's not true 
that self-interest requires a disregard for or a victimization of others, so it's a mistake to include them both together in this concept of selfishness as a package deal. Okay, so if it's not true that self-interest means disregarding people or, or treating them as victims to be exploited, what does it mean? What does it look like to truly pursue your own self-interest? So one possibility that people might propose is it's just a matter of doing whatever you want to do, right? Pursuing your self-interest just means doing whatever you want. And often it's put as doing whatever you feel like doing, right? So if you do something because you want to do it or you feel like doing it, does that make it something that's in your self-interest? Well, I think there's a problem with that idea too because there are often things that we feel like doing that aren't good for us, right? Um, there are all kinds of things that we might want to do or feel like doing, but we know that they'll have bad consequences for us later on. So you might want to eat an entire box of donuts, but you know that that's not going to be a very healthy choice. Or if you're a student, you know, you might feel like skipping the final exam. Uh, maybe you'd rather go see a movie instead. But you know that that's not going to be a good choice. So self-interest is not just a matter of following your whims or your feelings. Just because you want to do something, it doesn't make it something that's in your long-range rational self-interest. So what is in your self-interest? Well, uh, yeah. So Ayn Rand's perspective on this is that to figure out what's in a person's self-interest, you first have to take a very broad perspective on human life. You have to look at man's nature and ask, what kinds of values and what kinds of actions will result in a life of flourishing and happiness? And what kinds of actions and what kinds of choices will lead to harm and destruction? So you have to treat ethics like a science. You have to draw abstract principles that apply to all human beings and that provide a standard for each person to use um, to choose the specific values and actions that they will pursue in their own life. So from Ayn Rand's point of view, this is the whole purpose of ethics. Um, this is why we need ethics. The whole point of morality is to provide a set of principles for us to follow to guide our choices and actions in life so that we can achieve a life of success and happiness. Now what that looks like is the whole content of Ayn Rand's ethical philosophy. So Rand developed a whole systematic code of morality that offers the kind of guidance I've just described. Today I'm just going to give you a kind of brief indication of some aspects of, of Rand's perspective. But if you read her writings, especially her novel Atlas Shrugged and uh, her book The Virtue of Selfishness, you can find a full detailed explanation of her moral philosophy. So a brief indication. The principles that Ayn Rand identifies as offering the kind of guidance that we need take the form of a set of moral virtues. So normally if we think about moral virtues, we think of things like faith, hope, and charity. So this is, these are not part of Ayn Rand's set of moral virtues, right? Um, the kinds of virtues that Ayn Rand recognizes as, as providing the kind of guidance that we need in life are things like rationality, independence, integrity, justice, honesty, pride, productiveness. So these are broad, abstract principles of action for us to follow, for us to apply to the specific things that we do in life. And it's by following these virtues that we can achieve success and happiness. Now this is a very different view of morality from what we're used to. Normally when you think about morality, the, the morality that we're often presented with, that we often think about, you know, we think about a set of rules that we have to follow or duties that we have to obey, right? Uh, yeah. So we think about, you know, that morality consists of something like the Ten Commandments. These are rules that we have to follow. 
And the whole goal of morality is to counteract our self-interest, right? Is to get us to stop being selfish, to do our duty, and to follow the commandments, right? So Rand's perspective on morality is completely the opposite of this. It completely overturns the conventional view. The whole purpose of morality is to teach us how to follow our, and achieve our self-interest. And the way we achieve it is not by blindly following commandments, it's by understanding these broad abstract principles um, that tell us what human life requires if we want to achieve success and happiness and applying those to our lives. Let's consider an example. So one of the virtues that I talked about in Rand's moral system is the virtue of productiveness. Now, why is productiveness a moral virtue for Rand? Well, it's a moral virtue because it's one of the fundamental requirements of human life. Human beings survive by producing the things that we need. You know, we don't just find clothes and food and iPhones sitting around in nature. Um, we have to create them through productive work. So we have to take the materials that we find around us in nature and reshape them to produce the things that support our ability to thrive. Now, unlike the lower organisms, we're not programmed to pursue these things automatically. So we don't automatically draw water from the soil like plants, right? We don't even know automatically, you know, how to feed ourselves out in the wild. If you throw me in the jungle, I'm not going to do as well as this monkey getting his banana, right? I'm probably going to starve. We need to use our ability to reason to discover the things that support our lives, and then we have to reshape nature to produce those values. So one of the things that each one of us needs to do is find and choose some form of productive work to support ourselves. Now notice that this is a universal principle that applies to everybody, but it doesn't specifically tell anyone, you know, any, any specific line of work that they should pursue. It doesn't say that you, you, know, you should become an artist and you should become an entrepreneur and you should become a doctor, right? Each of us has to apply the principle of productiveness to our own life by choosing the specific work that we will do in life. Most of our waking hours are spent working. So productive work is one of the central values of our lives. A huge amount of the fulfillment and joy that we have in life comes when we find a career that fills our life with purpose and meaning. And notice that this is nothing like how Al Capone lived his life, right? A criminal spends his whole life trying to avoid rational, productive work by preying on other people. You know, so it's no accident that someone like this ends up dying of syphilis in Alcatraz, right? This is not somebody who pursued a life of reason and purpose and actually pursued his long-range rational self-interest. So one final point about productiveness. Notice also that this is a demanding, lifelong process. We need to choose the kind of work we want to do. We need to get the training and acquire the skills and experience to be able to do that kind of work. We need, you know, that can take years, right? We need to look for a job in that field uh, or start a company or do something. We need to manage our career over time. If we find that we're not enjoying the work that we're doing, we need to find a different line of work, right? So the virtue of productiveness is something we practice over the course of our whole lives. So we have a very broad principle that tells us one of the major requirements of a rational, successful, fulfilling life, and then we have to continuously work over time to apply that principle to our own individual lives. And, uh, let's see. and this is the pattern for all of morality. So in, in Rand's view, this is what it means to be truly selfish. So happiness in life, you know, it doesn't come from following our whims or from following a set of rules or commandments. Happiness comes from the process of pursuing and achieving rational values in all major areas of life. So this is, a, this is an important point, so I'm gonna say this again. Happiness comes from the process of pursuing and achieving rational goals and rational values in all the major areas of life. And this is something that takes a sustained effort 
over time. Each one of us has to do the work to um, build this into our lives. So we need to, these, these, these various moral virtues that, that Rand presents as part of our ethical system, we need to work to understand what those virtues mean and what they tell us and how, they, how they're supposed to apply to our lives. So we have to understand the principles and how to apply them. Then we have to define and choose the specific values that we're going to pursue in life that makes our individual life worth living. And then we have to work over time to pursue and achieve those values over the course of our whole life. So that, in Rand's view, is what it takes to achieve happiness and fulfillment in life. And notice how radically different this is from our conventional view of what it means to be selfish. This is nothing like what we typically think about when we think about selfishness. So, so being properly selfish requires a sustained, principled focus on the challenge of defining, pursuing, and achieving your own values and long-term well-being. So this is a, a demanding, lifelong process, but this is what it looks like to achieve genuine fulfillment and happiness in life. So let me end by making one final point, and that is that getting our concepts right really makes a difference. Our conventional way of thinking about selfishness is deeply mistaken. I like this meme, so I keep putting it up. Um, but it's mistaken in a way that actually makes it harder for us to achieve a happy, fulfilling life. We use, the reason we have these moral concepts, so I've talked about selfishness and, and Ben is gonna talk about altruism and sacrifice. The reason we use these moral concepts um, to help us think about what's right and wrong, you know, to help us make decisions about how to act and what values to pursue in life. So if our understanding of these concepts is, is wrong in some fundamental way, then the whole way that we think about life and values and how to make decisions about these things is going to be confused and distorted. Right? Think of it this way. If you're trying to build a piece of furniture and all you have to work with are broken tools, you know, that's, gonna, that's not going to get you very far. So imagine how hard it is to build a life when some of your most important conceptual tools are broken. And if you have a concept of selfishness, you know, that's exemplified by someone like Al Capone, you know, how is that going to affect the way that you think about what it means to pursue your own self-interest and your own well-being? So this is the position that Rand thinks we're all in. We have a deeply mistaken understanding of morality, and that causes a lot of confusion about the choices that we should make, about our values, and about how to live our lives. And what she argues is that if we take a fresh look at reality and we look at the requirements of human life, what we find is that selfishness properly understood is actually an important virtue in life. It's, it's the virtue of taking your own life and your own happiness seriously, you know, of assuming the responsibility for pursuing and achieving what you want out of life. So let me just uh, summarize the final point. So getting our concepts right makes a difference because we think in terms of concepts. And if we rethink what it means to be selfish, we find that far from being a vice, it's actually a crucially important virtue. Thank you. I'm just gonna say a couple more things here. So, this is just a brief introduction to a big subject. You know, as I said, Ayn Rand had a lot to say about morality and about life and happiness. So if you want to follow up and explore her ideas more, I definitely recommend reading her novels, The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged, especially, and her book, The Virtue of Selfishness. And I wanted to give you some other things that you can do if you want to follow up. Um, we, have, we have an app that has courses on Ayn Rand's philosophy. And you can get it you know, on, on, on the iPhone store, on the Google store. You can download it right away. And um, there's hours and hours of content about all aspects of Rand's ideas, and you can, you can study those. Um, and I also, oopsie. Tal, you got some cool animations here. Um, 
And the other thing you can do is stay connected and get involved. So we have Maria in Latin America and Roberto here. You know, the, I, I think there's a pretty active community here already, but if, but if you want to form discussion groups and study groups and that sort of thing, you can, you can do that. Um, okay, so I'm gonna just leave my, my uh, takeaways up here and we can take questions. Temos tempo, tempo para duas perguntas. Nós também recebemos perguntas através do, da transmissão online. Uh, nós podemos ler para aqueles que enviarem também. Oi, bom dia. Obrigada pela palestra. É, eu entendo que um dos maiores problemas que a falta do egoísmo uh, tem como consequência é exigir que as virtudes das pessoas, que foram as que você colocou ali no, na apresentação, é, sejam usadas como uma punição é, contra elas mesmas. E fazendo com que as pessoas se sentem culpadas por não, ser, não buscarem os seus próprios interesses. Né? E aí isso acaba fazendo as pessoas é, exigirem que você funcione é, contra a sua vontade ou seu próprio interesse, é, vinculando, por exemplo, amor com medo, é, capacidade com punição e ambição com confisco, ou como uma coisa que precisa, por exemplo, você ser ambicioso é porque você quer roubar ou que você quer, sei lá, nesse sentido. Então, isso é uma inversão de valor né, que acaba é, sendo é, propagada né, para uma sociedade. Então, a minha pergunta seria como que se restabelece isso numa sociedade, sendo que essa essa forma de pensar e agir é, já se estabeleceu. E a segunda pergunta, que é bem rápida, é que eu acho que egoísmo aqui no Brasil tem tipo uma semântica estilo livre, assim, cada um entende com da forma como quiser. Uh, a gente chama aqui de semântica freestyle. <risos> e como que a gente conseguiria fazer a palavra egoísmo ser mais aceitável uh, entre as pessoas na sociedade? Obrigado. Ok, so to, to take the second part first, um, the uh, one of one of uh, the interesting things about Ayn Rand as a as a thinker about epistemology, about the theory of knowledge and so on, is that is that she thinks that you know, concepts are not just something out there that we have to take as a given. Even dictionary definitions, you know, they're written by people. And so they're, they're identifications of the facts of the world, but as interpreted by people, and we can go wrong. We can make mistakes about that. So this is what I, what I was saying about package deals and that sort of thing. Um, sometimes if there's a concept that's important enough, like egoism, um, it's it's just the very act of pointing out the kinds of things I was pointing out in my talk, pointing out that there's something wrong with this idea and that we need to have a have a better understanding of it is 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 part of the way of fighting I, I wasn't sure exactly what you meant by freestyle semantics, but I don't I'm not sure Ayn Rand would agree with the idea that we can be free to just make up the definitions of words as we see fit. We need to fight for um, what the ideas are that those words represent and you know, if it's something very important, like what, the, like the proper conception of selfishness that um, I was describing, we need to fight for people to be very clear on what that means. And to your, to the first part of your question, that you're absolutely right, and this is why I was saying that, you know, Ayn Rand is challenging 2,000 years of morality. Our whole moral perspective is that we have basically we have an alternative between being good, which means sacrificing for other people, or being bad, which means pursuing our self-interest. This is the alternative, and Ben is gonna say a lot more about you know, the, the, the issue of altruism and what's wrong with those concepts, but Ayn Rand's perspective is that we're offered this alternative, and it's a false alternative. Um, in, her, in her book, The Fountainhead, she describes it as you know, the two alternatives that were offered are sadism versus masochism, you know, and then that's, not a, that's not an alternative. So I, I think, um, 
the, the what, what's needed to fight that is to fight for a, a clearer and, and more rational understanding of these concepts. So. Eu gostaria de perguntar, uh, fica claro que a autorresponsabilidade aparece em contraposição à questão da culpa. Então, ao invés de uh, me sentir culpada, eu me responsabilizo pela pelas minhas capacidades e vou buscar saciá-las. Uh, contudo, o que uh, me incomoda um pouco é o uso da palavra egoísmo no sentido de que uh, se dirige ao ego. né? E, muitas vezes, uh, no entendimento popular, o ego não está a favor uh, especificamente da minha capacidade de produzir e de viver as minhas potencialidades. Então, uh, uh, eu, eu pergunto assim, por que o uso dessa palavra, ao invés de autorresponsabilidade, vamos chamar assim, ou uma outra, me incomoda um pouco, e eu acho que uh, se, 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 se fica explicando muito o uso da palavra egoísmo também, justamente para não haver esse mal entendido. né? Queria sua opinião sobre isso. Obrigada. Yeah, so I think, I think it's a very similar issue with the word ego. It has all the same associations that we have with the idea of selfishness. But what is your ego? Your ego is yourself. Your ego is your capacity to value and your capacity to think and to pursue values in life. And so when you talk about somebody, you know, being egoistic and, and you know, it's, it's, it's the same issue. And I mean, it's completely natural and right that we have these negative associations with the ego because we have these misconceptions about morality. So it's part of the same battle, I think, to fight for a better conception of the self. So, yeah. Okay, are we, uh, one more? No? Okay, I think we're, okay. Well, the, well, português. Uh, quando eu li uh, a Revolta de Atlas e eu me deparei com esse conceito de que uh, as realizações uh, nos fazem feliz, né? Esse, esse tá ligado à felicidade são as nossas realizações. Isso eu comprei na hora a ideia. Uh, fez sentido para mim e eu não questionei essa, essa a, além. E Há umas duas, três semanas atrás, eu estava lendo um debate no, no Reddit e era sobre isso, né? sobre as realizações fazerem né, a pessoa feliz. Então, e alguém que perguntou, mas eu, eu, o que, que eu, eu não sei por onde começar, né? e a resposta veio da, do, daquele professor de psicanálise em canadense, que eu esqueci o nome, que agora é um popstar. É, Jordan Peterson. Sim, sim. Ele é, começa arrumando a sua casa, né? organiza as coisas simples da vida. E alguém escreveu, eu já tentei essas esse, essas coisas de uh, little man é, e de pessoas pequenas, comuns, e só me faz mais infeliz e querer me matar. Claro que eu acho que ele tem um problema psicológico maior ali, mas o que o que me fez perceber naquele momento, é que eu não tinha argumentos para dizer por que, que as realizações vão me fazer feliz. Eu não sabia... Essa é uma coisa muito pessoal minha, fez sentido para mim. Mas como eu fundamento racionalmente por que, que a, a, a realizar os, alguma coisa na minha vida vai fazer feliz? Se para ele ele está dizendo que não faz. É, como esse valor, que para mim é um valor... Por que, que ele vai ser um valor para outro? Eu não, eu, eu não consigo colocar isso de uma forma racional. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I think the first mistake is spending too much time on Reddit. Um, but no, so, so um, the perspective on happiness is, it's, so there's a, a question that you might have of, of Does happiness come from just achieving your values? You know, so you work your whole life and you're not happy and then, and then you finally achieve something and boom, you get a moment of happiness. 
I think um, Ayn Rand's perspective on this is it's, it's, it's a state of consciousness that she, she defines it as happiness is a state of consciousness that comes from the achievement of values. But it's the, it's the whole process, as I, as I tried to indicate in the talk, it's the process of living your life uh, and, and of defining and choosing the values and working towards them. Um, that process itself I mean, for, if, you know, for, if, you, if you enjoy the work that you do, you know that the, that provides a lot of deep fulfillment and meaning in life. Um, even if, say, you're working towards a big goal at work and you haven't achieved it yet, but the, just the very act of pursuing it is deeply fulfilling and part of, part of uh, the happiness that you feel in life. And then when you, when you achieve it, you know, that adds to it as well. So it's... But the, so it's, it's um, the perspective is not, you know, you choose a set of values and you, you go out and get them, and once you get them, then you're happy. It's, it's, it's uh, the, the perspective is that it's, it's, a, it's an overriding state of consciousness that comes from, from um, living life in a way that is, is consistent with how human beings are meant to live their life. And so it's, it's the action, it's all the, all the actions that go into, um, living that kind of life. Um, so, you know, for, for someone, I mean, uh, as you said, I think for someone who's, who's not happy, you know, maybe there's psychological issues that they need to work on and how do they get out of that? Um, so that, that's, those are, those are complicated issues in themselves. But for someone, you know, who's not necessarily dealing with complicated psychological issues, you know, the perspective is that, is that you, you, have an, have an integrated set of values in your life. You have your work and your relationships and your loved ones and the things that you like to do. And they're all, they all go together to make up your life. And it's the act of pursuing those, the, it's the act of living your life and pursuing those that, that provides this background feeling of happiness. And that's, you know, I think that's the perspective here. So. <laughs>